want to talk about genomes and genetics. And what that means is we're going to go through all the different kinds of nucleic acids that you can find in different virus particles. We're going to talk a bit about what in, is encoded in them. And then we will go through some of the major viruses we'll talk about in this course. And at the end, I want to talk about how you would manipulate these genomes to study the viruses. Remember, the viruses were discovered at the end of the 1800s, but it wasn't until the 1950s that we learned that the viral nucleic acid that's in the virus particle is actually the genetic code of the virus particle. It's a long time ago, 1950s. Now, we didn't recognize that DNA was genetic material until 1944. Right? We had a group here at Rockefeller University, Avery McLeod and McCarty did their famous experiment where they showed they could transform bacteria, make them look different by moving DNA from one bacterium to another. And um, then in 1953, of course, the structure of DNA was solved by Watson and Crick with a lot of help from Rosalind Franklin, right? And um, 1953, by the way, is the year that I was born, and that is why I'm a scientist. Because in that year, there are actually some other scientific things that happened besides discovery of DNA. Now, it wasn't until the 50s that people showed that the nucleic acid of viruses is actually the genetic material. There were two separate studies. On the left, the Hershey Chase experiment with a phage called T4. And this is an experiment that you learn about in high school. And then you learn about it again in college. And then for most of you, that's the end of it. We'll talk a little bit about it. It was this phage that we shown. Its DNA is the genetic material. And then on the right, tobacco mosaic virus. An investigator named Frankel Conrad showed that the RNA of that virus is the genetic material. So TMV was different because it had an RNA genome. And we'll talk a lot about that in this course. What, what Frankel Conrad did was to extract the RNA from the particle, from the tobacco mosaic virus particle, and show if you put it into tobacco leaves, it would initiate an infection. So that meant that the RNA was the genetic material. What he also did was to separate the RNA and the protein, and so the protein on its own could not initiate an infection, but when you put them back together, the RNA plus the protein to make a virus particle, you could then infect cells with that. So let's take a look at the Hershey Chase experiment. Now, Alfred Hershey, that's him right there, and then Martha Chase was his uh, assistant, and they both did this very famous experiment in 1952. And this is a famous kitchen blender experiment, which I'm sure you've heard of. But what you do here, you take bacteriophage, and you either label the protein with radioactive sulfur, or you label the DNA with radioactive phosphorus. And so now you have a phage with the, the labeled DNA or labeled protein, two separate preparations. And then you add those phages to a culture of E. coli, and you let the phage attach and put its DNA into the cell for a very short time. You give it a few minutes. And then he would put this mixture in a kitchen blender and run it. And that would shear the phages off so they wouldn't continue to put their nucleic acid into the cells. Uh, and then he let the, the uh, infection go. And he said, in the new phages that are made, where is the radioactivity? And so if he labeled the protein, the new phages made had no radioactivity in them, but if he labeled the phosphorus, some of the new phages, you could find radioactive DNA in the progeny, showing that it's the DNA that's the genetic material because that's passed on to the progeny phage. And so this is actually the blender, one of the blenders that he used here on the left. And it is actually in a museum at Cold Spring Harbor. If you're ever out there for a meeting out on Long Island, you can see this uh, blender. And this is a, a letter uh, where he talked about the experiment. I can't imagine uh, putting radioactive material in a kitchen blender and blending it. You're getting a huge aerosol, right, of radioactivity. But that's what 
we did in those days, we did lots of things that were not safe in the interest of science. So this showed that the DNA is the genetic material uh, of this phage. And of course, we now know this is the case for all living things, that the, either DNA or RNA is the genetic code. Now, something that's going to make our lives a lot easier throughout this course is uh, that we can take all the thousands and thousands of different virus particles, which I've hinted to you about so far, and actually distill them down into a finite number of virus genomes of different types. In fact, seven. There's seven different genomes. And that's a number you can remember. You can just think of a subway number seven, and uh, that's all you need to know. There are seven different types of viral genome. And that's what I want to talk a little bit about today. How do we do this? Well, the reason we can do that is because, as I said at the end of the first session, all viruses need to make mRNA that can be read by host ribosomes because no virus encodes a ribosome. No virus encodes a complete translational machinery. So, but they have to use the cellulars, the cells translation machinery, and the, so the mRNA has to be compatible with it. All viruses do this. We know no exceptions to that rule. And so that allows us to reduce all the viruses to seven different categories. And this, putting the viruses into seven groups, was done by a virologist named David Baltimore. He's shown here. He likes the fish, apparently. Uh, he won a Nobel Prize in the 70s for discovering an enzyme we'll talk about quite a bit later on in this course. But before he uh, discovered that enzyme, he was thinking a lot about how viruses replicate. And he thought, well, if all viruses have to make mRNA that has to be compatible with host ribosomes, then I can map out how every virus gets to that. When he did that, he found six different categories. He missed the seventh because we hadn't known those viruses at the time. And so this is called the Baltimore classification, and that's where the seven groups come from. You put mRNA in the middle, and then you can see there are seven different kinds of genomes, and you can trace the way those genomes get to mRNA. And this is enormously informative, because if I give you any kind of nucleic acid, any of those seven types, that's all there are, you could tell me, knowing this scheme, how each of those gets to mRNA. You need, a, you need to know a few other things, which I'll tell you today, but it's a wonderful scheme. So the seven types of nucleic acid, we have double-stranded DNA, we have single-stranded DNA. These are nucleic acids that can be found in different kinds of viruses. Single-stranded DNA, we have double-stranded RNA, we have single-stranded RNA, three different kinds of single-stranded RNA. We have plus sense that goes through an RNA intermediate. We have plus sense that goes through a DNA intermediate. And then we have minus sense RNA. And we're going to go through all of these today so you'll understand what each of them means. But again, those are the seven different types of viral genomes that you can find on the planet. No one has ever discovered any other type. Now, it might be that there's one out there. And it's an interesting exercise to think of what an eighth type of genome might be. But this is so far what we have found. Here are some important definitions for you, because I've started to use terms which you may not recognize. You all know what mRNA is. Of course, that is the RNA that's translated on ribosomes to make protein. We say that is of positive polarity. We call it the plus strand. It has nothing to do with electrical charge or anything else. It just is a convention. Someone years ago said, let's call mRNA plus, and that's stuck. So mRNA is always the plus strand. DNA of the same polarity of mRNA is also called the plus strand. And of course, the complementary strands are called minus strands or negative strands. I'll use those terms interchangeably. Now, despite the fact that mRNA is always the plus strand, not all plus RNA is in fact mRNA. What that means is, just because a virus has a plus RNA somewhere in its reproduction cycle, doesn't mean it's going to be translated. And we'll see some examples of that uh, today and throughout these first lectures. So there again is our Baltimore scheme, just to remind you. And I think it's just, it's just wonderful how you can use this to trace all of these genomes. And as I said before, this is the elegance of it. 
All you need to know is the nature of the genome, one of those seven types. I can tell you double-stranded RNA, and you should be able to tell me exactly how it gets to mRNA. And we're going to go through that today. You just need to know a few things about the nature of nucleic acid and, and what or what not, what or can or cannot be translated. So again, those are the seven classes. We have double-stranded DNA. I left out earlier the other kind of double-stranded DNA, which is actually gapped. That's the seventh form that Baltimore missed because we didn't have those viruses uh, back in the 70s. We didn't know about them. So we have double-stranded DNA, gapped double-stranded DNA. We have single-stranded DNA, double-stranded RNA, and then single-stranded RNA, plus or minus, or plus with a DNA intermediate. And for the first part of today, I want to go through each of these classes and explain to you how the reproduction works, how you get to mRNA from each of these nucleic acids. And let's do a quick quiz first. Why is mRNA at the center? A, because all virus particles contain mRNA. B, there's no reason. C, because all viral genomes are mRNAs. Because mRNA must be made from all viral genomes. Because Baltimore studied mRNA. The answer, of course, is D. Why do we put mRNA in the middle? Because all viral genomes have to make mRNA. 92% of you got that. A lot of you said, because all particles contain mRNA. And that's not correct. As you'll see, and you, you see already from the Baltimore scheme, those seven different genome types, those are what's in virus particles. But now you know that it's because all viral genomes must make mRNA. Now, these genomes are incredibly diverse. We've managed to simplify them into seven classes, which is good. But within those seven classes, there's an incredible amount of structural diversity, and that's shown here. We can have linear genomes, right? The DNA or the RNA is just a linear molecule. We can have circular genomes. Both RNA and DNA can be circular. Here's a DNA circle, here's an RNA circle. The genome can be in pieces. We call that segmented. Here's an example of a segmented RNA genome. It can be gapped in the case of that seventh class. The double-stranded DNA is not complete. We'll talk about this in more detail in a moment. You can have single-stranded plus or minus strand. You can even have ambisense, which means it's got a combination of both plus and minus. It can be double-stranded either RNA or DNA, can have covalently attached proteins. In some cases, the linear DNA, the ends are actually covalently linked. And that's this structure here at the bottom, called that cross-linked ends. And of course, we can also have, in these gap genomes, we can also have bits of RNA attached to them. Now, if you notice here, we use specific colors for these nucleic acids. And that's done on purpose, of course, so that you know exactly what you're looking at. Blue is DNA and green is RNA. And we never use those colors for proteins, just so we don't confuse you. So here's a protein, it's orange. And the two strands of each nucleic acid are colored differently. So we have light, light blue and dark blue. The dark blue is the plus strand, and the light is the minus. Same with RNA, we have a kind of a, a nice green color. An Irish green color, maybe, is the plus strand. And then an olive green, perhaps, for the minus strand. So those are the two conventions there. Sometimes you'll see other colors used for nucleic acid, like orange here means non-coding region. <clears throat> OK, so blue DNA and green is RNA. All right, so now we have seven classes of genomes. We have lots of configurations, as I've just showed you. What's the function of all this? What is the function of all this diversity? Well. I can easily explain why we have both DNA and RNA genomes in viruses. And that's unique, by the way, because we, our genomes are all DNA, of course, and everything else we know of on the planet is the DNA genome. And it's only viruses that have both either DNA or RNA genomes. And that's because we think that the first life forms, the first organisms that arose uh, in the early days of Earth's evolution had RNA genomes. In fact, we think that 
As soon as the Earth cooled sufficiently to allow chemistry to occur, it was actually RNA molecules that formed, and they became self-replicating RNAs. And they existed in the absence of proteins. They, be, they were catalytic, and the ribosome today is a, is a relic of that era, probably, because the catalytic activity of the ribosome is based on RNA. And there are many other RNAs that are catalytic that we know about, self-splicing introns, for example. These are probably relics of this period when there was only RNA on Earth. Eventually, RNA cells arose, we believe, and possibly RNA viruses of those RNA cells. But at some point, there was a switch to DNA. I mean, it didn't happen overnight, of course. It took many, many years for this to happen. And at this point, we proteins had already evolved to act in those RNA-based cells. And it's thought that an enzyme evolved called reverse transcriptase, which we have today in many viruses and all of our genomes, in fact, that could convert RNA to DNA. So at that point, there was a switch to DNA genomes, and that allowed cells to get bigger and viruses to get bigger as well, because RNA, is, there is a limit to the size that RNA can achieve. We're not sure what the limit is. It might be 100,000 bases or so, but you know, DNA genomes can be uh, billions of bases in length. DNA is inherently more stable. It's less mutagenic than RNA and so forth. So DNA genomes probably arose and, and survived and were selected because they could get bigger. So all the, the only genomes on the planet today are viral, that are RNA are viral. And in fact, there are some virus-like entities, we call them viroids, V-I-R-O-I-D-S. These are clearly relics of the RNA world because they encode no protein. These are circles of RNA naked RNA that encode no protein that infect plants. They're actually agricultural pathogens. They're very important in agriculture. They spread from plant to plant. They infect the plant cells. They cause damage, and they encode no protein. So these are clearly relics of what was once around in the RNA world. We will talk about them later. They're really, really interesting. So that's why we have both DNA and RNA. RNA arose first, DNA later, but they're both evolutionarily still competitive. They have niches that they can both exist in. The other parts of this question are harder to answer. What's the function of a linear versus a circular versus a segmented, double strand, single strand, plus or minus polarity? I just can't give you an answer for that. All we can say is all of these forms exist, therefore they must be evolutionarily competitive, they must have a niche in which they can exist. Now, if you asked me, I would say that the plus strand RNA genome should predominate. In fact, there are many, many plus stranded RNA viruses on the planet because it's the most simple strategy. The plus strand can be, enter the cell and immediately be translated because it's mRNA. Yet, minus strand RNA viruses also predominate, and these viruses, when the RNA gets into a cell, can't replicate. They have to carry an enzyme in with them. It's more complicated, yet they both have uh, scenarios where they can survive. So I can't tell you what the function is of the diversity, only that in specific situations it works for these particular viruses. So you should learn these seven genome types. If you do, you'll immediately understand how all these viruses work. You will understand, if I tell you double-stranded RNA, you'll know exactly how to get uh, to mRNA. You'll know how mRNA is made. And in fact, you'll know how the genome is copied as well, as we'll see shortly. Now, what's encoded in a genome? What sorts of things? Well, we have uh, gene products, proteins. We have regulatory signals. We have small RNAs now we know. Uh, small interfering RNAs, circular RNAs, long non-coding RNAs, and these are involved in protein synthesis, replication of the genome, making more copies of it, assembly of the genome into a new particles to be released from the cell, timing the replication cycle to make sure things are made when they're needed. We'll encounter this later on. And then when we get into an organism, these viruses have to modulate host defenses. So they have to encode proteins that do that, or RNAs that do that. In fact, no virus on the planet 
has zero proteins in its genome that antagonize host defenses. Every virus has to have at least one antagonist of host defenses, otherwise it's gone. Host defenses are so good. And it needs to, these genomes need to encode proteins and nucleic acids that allow spread to other cells in hosts. So those are some of the informations that are encoded in the genome, and we'll be encountering this as we talk about how it works. Here is a new virus, which is amazing. It's called Tupan virus. And that's a picture of it on the right. This is a virus that infects amoeba. So it's a eukaryotic virus, but it just looks so beautiful. It has this capsid, the spherical capsid, and attached to it is some kind of linear extension whose function is completely unknown. Nevertheless, it's gorgeous. This is an electron micrograph, and of course, this is colored. None of these things have any color at that size. The, one, the reason I'm telling you about this is because the genome encodes 20 amino acyl tRNA synthetases. Those are the enzymes that put the amino acid onto the tRNA. 70 tRNAs, multiple translation, initiation, and elongation proteins, the proteins needed to make protein from mRNA. This is, and multiple translation-related genes, this is what's been called the most complete translational apparatus of the virusphere, the virusphere being all the viruses on the planet. As far as we know, no other virus encodes so much of the translational apparatus. This was discovered in a lab in France, and the, the French said only the ribosome is lacking in this genome. It doesn't encode a ribosome. So it doesn't have a complete translation system, but it has a lot of it. And this is remarkable because when I started teaching this course 10 years ago, no virus encoded <coughs> any part of the translation system. It was a new discovery. The Mimi viruses were the first to have some tRNAs in their genome. And now this is the most complete. We don't understand why these viruses have things that are also in the cell. Because cells have all these enzymes. They have amino acyl tRNA synthesis. They have tRNAs and all that. Why is this? Well, it could be that the, the genetic code is slightly different for the virus versus the cell. Maybe it wants to op optimize uh, what it's doing. But this is remarkable that viruses can do this. And I'm just wondering what's the limit in terms of uh, coding. Yes? Could it evolve to gain ribosomes? It could, but you still need a cell to make the proteins in, right? You need the energy and the precursors and so forth. And if it did all that, then it would no longer be a cell, a virus, excuse me. It would no longer be a virus because, remember, a virus is an obligate intracellular parasite. Once it can do everything on its own, then it's a cell. So viruses were probably once cells, and they escaped from them and became reduced and uh, are no longer cells. We'll come back to that when we talk about evolution. What is not encoded in a genome? Well, you don't have the complete protein synthesis machinery. You have some, as I showed you, but you don't have the ribosome. Uh, you don't have genes encoding proteins involved in membrane biosynthesis. And this list slowly gets smaller and smaller. Last time I said no genes involved in energy metabolism, but in the past year, some genes in fermentation pathways were discovered encoded in a virus genome. No centromeres, no telomeres, like you would find in cellular chromosomes. But again, maybe we just haven't found any of these things. Maybe there are viruses out there that have them. And remember, every time we discover a giant virus, 90% of the genes that we see by sequencing are novel. We have no idea what they do. They have no homology to any known proteins. So maybe they are doing some of these functions and we don't know it. I thought you might be amused to see the biggest and the smallest of viral genomes. So these are the 10 largest known viral genomes. Uh, the biggest so far is Pandora virus Salinas. Uh, this was, uh, this I showed you the first day, that big 1.5 micron virus particle that you can see in a light microscope. Its genome is almost two and a half million base pairs in length, and it encodes 2,500 proteins. And then we have a whole range of big ones, 1.9, 1.5, and so forth. There's two pan virus, where the beautiful blue virus I just showed you. That's pretty good. And others with interesting names. 
like mama virus, mimi virus, and mumu virus. These are all named by these French virologists in Marseille. Number 10 is uh, less than a million base pairs. Now, for comparison, on the, on the upper right there, that's the size of the genome of a bacterium, Haemophilus influenzae, right? It's pretty small, 1.8 million base pairs. That was the first genome, bacterial genome sequenced many years ago, 1.8 million base pairs. So it fits in between these two viruses. So these viruses, the biggest ones, their genomes are bigger than some free living bacteria. Here is the genome of an endosymbiotic bacteria, Nasuia, 112,000 base pairs, much smaller than these viral genomes. These are bacteria that have entered cells and have lost most of the genes in their genome and only retain what they need that they can't get from the host cells. So these we call highly reduced genomes. These bacteria can't live on their own. They have to live inside of another cell. They're endosymbionts, but it's remarkable that many virus genomes are bigger than them. However, they're not cells. These are viruses for sure because they still need a cell in which to replicate. Now at the other end, here are the smallest known viral genomes. And there is viroid at the top there. So technically it's not a virus, we call them viroid, but they exhibit lots of properties of viruses. And I said we'll talk about them later. The smallest viroid is 120 nucleotides in length and it encodes no proteins. Yet this RNA can get into plant cells, uh, it can replicate in the plant cell, and it can make the plants sick. So it's, as I said, a relic of the RNA world. Hepatitis delta satellite, this is a virus that can only replicate it in a cell infected with another virus. We'll talk about that later. It encodes one protein. All right, then, then we get to uh, autonomous viruses, which can replicate in cells on their own. There's circovirus is the smallest. Uh, these are viruses that replicate in, in all of us, these circo and anello viruses. 1,800, 2,100 base pair genomes, two and four proteins. And you can see it goes up to 4,000 bases here and seven proteins. So at the other end, the smallest genomes are quite small, encode very few proteins, yet these can get into cells and make new virus particles. Now the dependence of these small genomes on the cell is much greater, of course, than for viruses with bigger genomes. Viruses with bigger genomes have lots of proteins that they don't need from the cell, whereas these viruses need much more. And those are some of the things we'll be talking about as we go through the replication cycles. All right, the next question is, what information may be encoded in a viral genome? Gene products that catalyze membrane biosynthesis, complete protein synthesis systems, centromeres, telomeres, enzymes to replicate the viral genome. So the answer is E, enzymes to replicate the viral genomes. That's the only correct answer. Uh, viral genes, uh, viral genomes don't have genes that are involved in membrane biosynthesis. They don't have complete protein synthesis systems. Uh, they don't have centromeres or telomeres. DNA genomes. Now, as you know, our, our host genetic system is based on DNA. And so many DNA viruses, as you will see, simply are emulating what's going on in their host. However, and that's different, of course, than for RNA viruses, because the genome of cells is not RNA. So different things have to happen. Different events have to occur in RNA virus-infected cells. But most viral DNA genomes are not like cellular DNAs at all. Their structure is very different. They do not have um, the same kind of chromatin structure. They do not have chromatin at all, in fact. Um, and so they're very different, as you will see. And different mechanisms have evolved to get these viral DNAs to replicate that are quite different from the host cell. So let's go through some of these different, these seven different types or genome classes, if you will. And let's talk about some of the viruses within them that you may see again in this course. We don't cover every virus in this course, of course. As I told you earlier, we just cover a selection that there are enough to teach you how viruses work. But a lot of these that we'll see today are the ones we'll come back to. So here are viruses with double-stranded DNA genomes. And they include the adenoviruses. These are the family names, by the way, the formal family name. They all end in viridae. So adenoviridae are unique 
because they look different. They have an icosahedral shell, which we'll learn about next time, with these fibers sticking out. It looks like the old Sputnik satellite. Then we have herpes viruses, large enveloped viruses, papillomaviruses, polyomaviruses, and the giant pox viruses. These are all viruses with double-stranded DNAs, but their DNAs are all quite different, as we'll see. These are some of the, these are the families of double-stranded DNA viruses that I will come back to uh, over and over in this course. Here are the genomes of these double-stranded DNA viruses. And one of the things we'll be following later on is how these are, how they get to mRNA and how they replicate. So the general scheme, here's a part of the Baltimore scheme where we have mRNA in the middle. These double-stranded DNAs can be transcribed to make mRNA. In fact, among DNAs, only double-stranded DNA can serve as a substrate for transcription to produce mRNA. Single-stranded DNA doesn't work. Gapped double-stranded DNA does not work. That's one important fact that you want to remember because it'll tell you, given a viral genome, whether it can go directly to mRNA or not. So these double-stranded DNAs can be transcribed by RNA polymerase to give rise to mRNA, which of course then give rise to proteins to build new virus particles. So this is perhaps the simplest of the gene expression patterns that we'll look at. These viruses I've showed you can be grouped into two classes uh, depending on whether the genomes are copied by host DNA polymerase or whether the viruses encode their own DNA polymerase. DNA polymerase, of course, being the enzyme that will make more genomes to be incorporated into new particles. The genomes copied by host DNA polymerases are small. There's not enough room to encode a lot of proteins, so the, the DNA polymerase gene is left out to conserve space. And they include the polyoma viruses, these are circular double-stranded DNA genomes, about five or eight kilobases for the papillomaviruses. Again, they're small. They don't encode a lot of proteins, and DNA polymerase is not one of them. These are dependent on the host for that. The bigger genomes, adenoviruses, 36 to 48,000 base pairs of double-stranded linear DNA. Herpes viruses, 120 to 220,000 base pairs, again, double-stranded linear DNA, or the pox viruses, which can go up to 375,000 base pairs. These all encode their own DNA polymerase and many other proteins because the DNA is long and it can encode more proteins. So they uh, are replicated by DNA polymerases uh, encoded in the genome. And we'll look at all, some of the other proteins encoded in these genomes as well to understand how they work. There, the viruses with gapped double-stranded DNA genomes are unusual. This is the seventh class in the Baltimore scheme, the class he didn't see because we didn't discover these viruses until later. Uh, these are the hepadenoviruses or hepatitis B virus. They have this very curious genome, which is almost all double-stranded DNA. You can see it's circular. So the minus strand, the light blue strand, is complete. There's a break right at this point, and you can see there's a protein linked to the minus strand. So that's unusual. And then there's a gap. There's a bit of the plus strand missing. And, and on top of that, there's a little bit of RNA attached to one end of the plus strand. So this is a completely unique genome. This cannot be transcribed. There's no way. RNA polymerase will not transcribe this. The only way this can go to mRNA is for it to be made completely double-stranded. It has to be repaired. The RNA has to go. The protein has to go. The gap has to be filled in. Then it can be transcribed to mRNA. The way this happens, as you will see uh, later, is these DNAs come in the cell. They're repaired by cellular DNA repair enzymes. It takes out the RNA, removes the protein, fills in the gap. And then this is now a substrate for mRNA, which mRNA synthesis, which can go on to make proteins, of course. These viruses have an unusual enzyme in their reproduction cycle. And this uh, unusual enzyme is reverse transcriptase, which we'll come back to over and over in this course. It's the enzyme discovered by Baltimore and Howard Temin separately, got them Nobel Prizes. It takes RNA and makes a DNA copy of it. And in fact, this is in the, in the reproduction cycle of this virus. After the DNA is made double-stranded, you have mRNA made, some of which can be 
may translate it to protein. And then some of that is copied to DNA, which eventually is put into new virus particles. And in that process of making the DNA, it becomes gapped. And in fact, the protein left on the genome is the reverse transcriptase. And we'll see this later when we talk about reverse transcription. So this is a very unusual virus. Single-stranded DNA genomes include circular, single-stranded DNA, circle viruses, and anelloviruses. They're very small, the smallest known uh, autonomous viral genomes. These infect all of us with apparently no consequences. Uh, and then there are the parvoviruses, which have linear single-stranded DNA genomes. Among these are viruses that infect humans and cause disease. Parvovirus B19 causes a rash disease in humans called fifth disease. If you have a cat or a dog, you have to immunize them against canine and feline parvoviruses because they can be lethal to the animals. Uh, these uh, viruses package either the plus or the minus strand of the DNA. A minus strand or a plus single-stranded DNA cannot be transcribed to mRNA. It has to be made double-stranded. And so again, when these uh, DNAs come into cells, they are repaired by cellular enzymes to be made double-stranded DNA, and then that can be a substrate for mRNA synthesis, which will eventually give rise to proteins and new, new viral particles. So that's the single-stranded uh, DNA genomes. So we looked at double-stranded DNA, gapped, double-stranded, and single-stranded DNA. Now our next question, which DNA genome on entry into the cell can be immediately copied into mRNA? That's the step I've been calling transcription. Double-stranded DNA, gapped double-stranded DNA, circular single-stranded <coughs> DNA, linear single-stranded DNA, all of the above. The answer is A, double-stranded DNA. Most of you got that. That's the only of these DNAs that can be transcribed. The others all have to be repaired. That is one of these facts that you should remember because it would really help you understand information flow in viral genomes. Let's look at RNA genomes. These are interesting for many reasons. Cells do not have enzymes that can copy RNA genomes. That's important for you to remember because it will influence the way you look at all of this uh, in terms of RNA viruses. Cells have no RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. Therefore, these viral genomes all have to encode one. The exception, of course, is the viroids, which may not even be viruses. They don't have an RNA polymerase. So RNA virus genomes code this RNA polymerase, and they produce mRNA and more genomes from RNA templates. And these RNA can come in many different forms, segmented, single or double-stranded. They can even be circular. All right, the first class of viruses are those with double-stranded RNA genomes. A double strand, of course, has both a plus and a minus strand. There are many viruses out there that have double-stranded RNA genomes. Uh, one family that we'll talk about is called the Rioviridae or Rioviruses, and a member of that is rotavirus, which causes gastroenteritis in humans. So these double-stranded RNA genomes have a plus and a minus strand, right? They have a plus, which is equivalent to mRNA, and a minus, which is not. Do you think these double-stranded RNAs can be directly translated by ribosomes? Who's, who thinks yes? Raise their hand. Who thinks no? They can't. Ribosomes can't access the plus strand in these double-stranded RNAs. All right, that's another factoid you need to know. Double-stranded RNA cannot be translated because that plus strand can't be accessed. So what has to happen is these have to be copied to form mRNAs, and that has to happen in the virus particles. So those viruses have to carry into the cell an enzyme to copy this double-stranded RNA into an mRNA because the cell has no way to do that. Just think, this double-stranded RNA gets into a cell. There's no RNA polymerase to copy it, and the cell can't translate it. It would be dead in the water. So these viruses have to have in their particles RNA-dependent RNA polymerase such that as soon as those get into cells, those enzymes make mRNA from the double-stranded RNA genome. And of course, that enzyme is also encoded in the genome, so it's passed on to uh, the next progeny. Yes? 
so the virus would have an enzyme that would denature the double strand so the ribosomes could access it. That would be a helicase that would unwind, which exists in the RNA world, and it could be encoded in the genome. So I don't see why not, but we don't see them. Theoretically, that should work. Maybe that's the eighth class of RNA genome, double strands that don't have uh, a polymerase in the interior, but that's a good idea, yeah. That would be simple, actually. A helicase would take it apart in the end. Now, it does require ATP, these helicases, so maybe that's the limiting factor. I don't know. But the, what's evolved is that these particles actually have enzymes in them. All right, double-stranded RNA can't be translated. It has to be transcribed. So these viruses have the enzyme to do that in the particle. Then we come to, to me, the most beautiful strategy, the plus-sense RNA. And there are a lot of viruses on the planet with plus-sense RNA genomes. We have coronaviruses like polio and rhino, uh, gastroenterotis viruses like the calici viruses. The whale I showed you on the first day it was infected with a calici virus. Coronaviruses, SARS coronavirus, MERS coronavirus, lots of flaviviruses. Flavus is Latin for yellow. That's where yellow fever virus came from because when people were infected with it, it infects the liver and jaundices you, you look yellow, and that's why they called it yellow fever, and now the whole family is named after it. West Nile, hepatitis C, Zika virus, they're all flavies, and Togaviridae, plus-stranded, all plus-stranded RNAs. Beautiful strategy. The RNA gets into the cell, bam, it's translated. You don't need a polymerase in the particle. You do not need a polymerase in the particle of these viruses because the RNA can be translated as soon as it gets in the cell. It can make all the proteins it needs, including the RNA polymerase, to get more replication. And these genomes, again, they're all plus-stranded. They're varying lengths. Some of them have poly-A tails. Some of them have proteins or caps at their five prime ends. We'll get back to that later. Then there's this wonderfully interesting family of viruses with plus-stranded RNA genomes but they replicate through a DNA intermediate. These are the retroviruses. There are many different retroviruses, but there are only two human pathogens, HIV, which we will talk about in its own lecture, because it's such an important virus, and human T lymphotropic virus. These have a unique genome strategy. The genome is plus stranded RNA, and this is a great example of when a plus RNA is not messenger RNA. Because when these viruses infect cells, that plus mRNA is not translated. In fact, it is never translated upon infection. However, if you took the RNA out of the particle and put it into cells, it would be translated. But as it goes in in the virus particle, the particle shields it. It never sees ribosomes. Instead, there is within the virus particles the enzyme reverse transcriptase which, as the virus is coming into the cell, copies the RNA to a DNA, a double-stranded DNA, which then goes in the nucleus of the cell and integrates into the cellular genome. So this plus mRNA never sees ribosomes in the entry of the virus into cells. That integrated DNA, by the way, in the cellular genome was called a provirus, and that's a term we'll use over and over. Provirus means uh, integrated viral DNA. Once the DNA is integrated into the genome, it's transcribed by cellular RNA polymerase, and the mRNAs go out into the cytoplasm and make proteins for the continuation of the replication cycle. So this is a really unique uh, cycle that we'll come back to many times. And that leaves us with some uh, two, two more classes. One is the minus sense single-stranded RNA viruses. Lots of these also on the planet. This includes uh, paramyxoviruses, measles, and mumps virus. Measles, when I was a kid, every kid got measles because we didn't have a vaccine. Everybody got measles. And now very few people do because we have a great vaccine, which, as you may know, people are not taking as they should. And as a consequence, we have outbreaks again of this infection, which can kill you. Rabies virus, bullet-shaped viruses. The filoviruses, like Ebola virus, these are negative-stranded influenza virus, negative-stranded RNA in pieces. So far, these have all been linear genomes. That's segmented. And arenaviruses, another segmented genome, like Lassa virus. Lassa virus uh, was, was first discovered in the 1960s in Nigeria, a story that is 
uh, captured in this wonderful book called Fever. This was like the first emerging virus. And I read this when I was in college, and it made me want to be a virologist. That's why I am here today, because of this book. So if you ever want to read a really interesting book, uh, it's written in the 70s. And part of it takes place at Columbia. There's a really good part of the story that takes place up at Columbia Medical Center. That's Lassa virus. So these viruses have minus RNA. If this RNA gets into the cell, can it be translated? No, it can't be. It's minus RNA by definition. So the RNA in the particle has to be packaged with an RNA polymerase. All of these negative strand RNA viruses have in the virus particles an RNA polymerase, comes in with the RNA, and then makes mRNA from the negative strands in the cell. That's the only way that this can work. And so minus RNA make messenger RNA in the cell by the viral polymerase, and that's translated to proteins. These viruses can have segmented or non-segmented genomes. Flu influenza virus, which is shown here, has a segmented genome of eight segments. Measles, mumps, and others have a, a single molecule of RNA uh, as, as opposed to a segmented one. Having a segmented genome allows you to do a very interesting thing, which is called reassortment. And that's simply the mixing of RNA segments in a cell that's infected with two different viruses. So let's say here we have two hypothetically different influenza viruses. These have eight RNA segments <coughs> in their particle. And here we, on the left we have red RNAs and on the right we have blue. And if by chance two different ones infect a cell, which happens often, we are often multiply infected, all of these RNAs are gonna be mixed in the cell, and the particles that come out, some will be parental red and parental blue, but some will have a mixture of segments. Like this one has seven blue and one red RNA segment. That's called reassortment. It's not recombination because there's no uh, breaking and joining of RNA, uh, of linear RNAs. This is just reassortment of segments. So it happens at a very high frequency. And so this is one of the reasons why uh, influenza is hard to control because the virus can vary by this mechanism. And we'll talk about this later uh, when we look at emerging viruses. And the last uh, genome that we're going to talk about is, is not part of the seven genome classes. We've already gone through all of those, but this is an interesting one. It is technically a minus stranded RNA genome. But the genome is actually ambisense. And all that means is that part of it is minus and part of it is plus. So th these viruses, arena viruses like Lassa virus, they have multiple RNA segments. Here's one of them shown here, just to show you that part of the RNA is positive stranded and part of it is negative stranded. And when this RNA enters the cell, it is not translated the virus particles actually have an RNA polymerase within them. So the first step is copying of that RNA into a messenger RNA, which is then translated. And so that's why we call them minus strand viruses, because all those viruses need to package an RNA polymerase. Even though this virus RNA has some aspects of plus strandedness, it, it doesn't translate those genomes. It copies them with a viral polymerase. Now, we often draw RNAs in many of these slides is linear molecules. You know, I make it a little squiggly to make it interesting, but in fact, RNAs don't look like that at all in cells or in virus particles. They have very uh, extensive structures. So on the top is the genome of, of a picornavirus, the way we would draw it, but on the bottom is, is partially the way it looks like in a virus particle or an infected cell. Uh, here is a plus-stranded RNA genome, and you can see it's folding into stem loops of various complexities. We'll come back to these later, but these are areas where there's complementarity in the RNA sequence, so it can base pair and form these structures. And you can see they can be quite extensive, so we call that secondary structure. But in addition, these secondary structures can interact. So for example, these red areas are base pairing with each other, and these blue areas and these orange areas are all base pairing to each other. So in fact, the RNA would even be more compact than is shown here. So the point here is that RNA is not just a line drawn on the board. 
And, and we will do that for simplicity, but in fact, it's really complicated in the virus particle. Which statement about viral RNA genomes is correct? Plus single-stranded RNA genomes may be translated to make viral protein. Double-stranded RNA genomes can be directly translated to make protein. Plus single-stranded RNA virus replication cycles do not require a minus strand intermediate. RNA genomes can be copied by host cell RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, all of the above. So the correct answer is A, plus single strand may be translated. And the may is there because not all plus RNA genomes are translated. Retroviruses are not. But others answered all of the others to a certain extent. So double strand RNA genomes can't be directly translated, right? That's, that's a thing you have to just remember. The minus strand intermediate is not something we focused on here. We'll talk about later, but when you start with a plus strand virus, to make more plus strands, you have to go through a minus strand intermediate. And so do not require is not correct. RNA genomes can be copied by host cell RNA polymerases. A few of you answered that. Maybe you're thinking of viroids. But as I said, we sort of keep those separate from the traditional viruses. So traditional viruses are not copied by host cell RNA polymerase. And so all of the above wouldn't be correct. Let's talk a little bit about genetic manipulation of viral genomes here at the end. Now, when in the 50s, when we recognized that the nucleic acid was the genome, people wanted to start making viral mutants to study how viruses worked. And this assay, the plaque assay, was critical in allowing genetics because it allowed you to pick individual plaques, make pure viral stocks, and if you were making mutants, you could pick mutants and study them and make pure stocks of those as well. So the plaque assay was critical. And we used all kinds of methods to mutagenize viral genomes, but we don't use most of those anymore because we use DNA copies of virus genomes to study their functions. And so now what we have for every virus that we study is what we call an infectious DNA clone. And we introduce this into cells by transfection. So what is that? You take your viral genome, if it's DNA, you can insert it into a bacterial plasmid. As you know, bacteria have chromosomal DNA and they have extra chromosomal DNAs called plasmids, small circles, that we have developed uh, in the recombinant DNA technology to be able to carry foreign sequences. So you can take your viral DNA and insert it into plasmids and propagate it in bacteria, make lots of the DNA, and then you can mutagenize it and study the mutant viruses. You can make all kinds of mutations in these DNAs. In fact, if you have an RNA virus, you can convert it to DNA using reverse transcriptase and clone it in the plasmid as well. That's why reverse transcriptase was so powerful, a discovery. This is, in fact, when you think about it, a modern validation of Hershey Chase's blender experiment. It tells you that the genome is the genetic material because you take a cloned copy of the nucleic acid, you put it in a cell, and out comes viruses. That tells you that the nucleic acid is the genetic information. And as we'll see later in this course, the, abil the ability to manipulate viral genomes has led to an entire new area of treating genetic diseases, uh, treating cancers, vaccinating, using viruses as vectors. We have taken this, the very viruses that cause disease and turned them around so that they're benefiting us. And we'll have an entire lecture on that later. So we use now uh, infectious DNA clones to study all aspects of viruses. And the, the word transfection, by the way, I say we transfect DNA into cells. This originally came from an experiment done with a bacteriophage where they took the DNA out of the particle and they put it into cells and out came viruses and they called it transfection because transformation, infection, that's where transfection comes from. Transformation was the name given to putting DNA into bacterial cells originally by Avery, McLeod, and McCarty. And we took that and turned it into transfection. So when we put DNA into cells and out come viruses, we call that transfection. Now this has been developed for many different viruses and I wanna give you sort of an overview of, of how it works and what you can do with it. 
So here is an example using poliovirus. Poliovirus is a virus with a plus stranded RNA genome. If you take poliovirus and infect cells, it will undergo a re reproduction cycle of about six hours and out come new polioviruses. If you extract viral RNA from the virus particle, you can transfect that into cells and out will come RNA because the plus mRNA is translated and it begins the infectious cycle just as if it were delivered by infection. However, if you take the viral RNA and use reverse transcriptase to convert it to a DNA copy and then put it in a bacterial plasmid, you now can make lots and lots of poliovirus DNA, which of course never exists in nature because this is an RNA virus. You can take this DNA and transfect it into cells and out will come <coughs> polioviruses because this DNA is transcribed when it gets into the cell. You make RNA and that initiates infection. And we can also take this DNA and make RNA from it in vitro using RNA polymerase, take those RNAs and put them in cells and we can make virus from that. So this is recovering poliovirus from cloned DNA. And you can see that if we, could, if we mutagenize the DNA, we can study different genes of the virus. We can insert foreign genes into the genome and express them. We can do all sorts of things by manipulating DNA. And that's the key here. You cannot manipulate RNA. But DNA, you've got all sorts of methods for manipulating it. The, the way you do this recovery of virus from cloned DNA is slightly different for different viruses. And I just want to give you a, a couple of examples. Here is influenza virus. Now, influenza viruses have segmented negative strand RNA genomes. And so getting a virus from cloned DNA was a little more complicated with influenza. So here's what had to be done. Each of these eight negative strand RNAs, you clone it, you make a DNA copy, and you clone it in a plasmid. And that is shown in the middle here. The whole plasmid isn't shown, just um, the viral sequences in blue and then a little bit of flanking sequence. And at one end, you have a polymerase II promoter. This is an RNA polymerase II. Our cells have three different DNA-dependent RNA polymerases in them. So this is a promoter for Pol2. And when this gets into a cell, RNA Pol2 in the cell will make the plus-stranded transcript. At the other end, we have a Pol1 promoter. It's a different enzyme. When this gets into the cell, this Pol1 promoter will be recognized by Pol1, and you'll make the negative strand of the viral genome. So in practice, what you do is you make eight plasmids, and you put them all in cells together, and out comes influenza virus. Because from each one, you make both plus RNA, which can be translated to make proteins, and you make negative RNAs, which go into new virus particles. So a little more complicated than with poliovirus, but again, it allows you to manipulate the genome at will. And we're, people are doing this extensively with flu because it's still a big uh, problem. It caused lots of outbreaks, and we want to figure out how to make better vaccines, and we'll talk about that later. Now, a little side on influenza. Uh, many of you may know that uh, back in 1918, there was a huge global outbreak of very severe influenza, a pandemic. When, when, it, when viruses cause global outbreaks, we call them pandemics. In 1918, this killed millions of people, and this is a typical scene of um, people being cared for in big armories. The hospitals didn't have enough beds for everyone, so they were just put in there. Many people died. This was, of course, during World War I, so many troops also died of this infection. However, we didn't have any influenza virus isolated until 1933. So even though this caused a huge pandemic, no one was able to isolate the virus. However, lots of people died uh, as a consequence of this infection, and many of them were in the army, and uh, many of those individuals had their lungs removed and, and little blocks of tissue embedded in, in a preservative and stored away for future study. And uh, those were, when, those were re recovered in 2005, so a number of investigators said, let's see if we can recover this 1918 virus. So they went to the army storehouse, and they found these blocks of tissues that had been stored since 1918, they were able to extract 
enough RNA from it to get some of the sequence of the genome. They converted it to DNA and they sequenced it and they got some of the eight genome segments. At the same time, uh, a number of individuals uh, went up to uh, the permafrost where individuals had died and were buried and they remained frozen in the ground since 1918. The graves were opened. Uh, they did a little in situ biopsy of the lung, just take some tissue right there in the grave. They extracted RNA with it. And between this, these two, formalin fixed samples in the grave uh, samples, they were able to get the sequence of all eight segments of the viral genome. So they made eight plasmids with those sequences in them, put them into cells, and out came the 1918 influenza virus, which hadn't been seen since those days. So it's now available in the laboratory. People study it under very high containment, biological containment, because you don't want it to get out again, right? It could cause a similar pandemic. Many good things have been learned from its study. So this is the sort of thing that you can do. You can do routine stuff in the lab, and then you can do experiments which on the surface look a little bit dangerous. You don't always have to clone the DNA in a plasmid. Here's a really amazing experiment just done last year where they synthesized the entire genome of a large DNA virus. So the virus here is called horsepox. Uh, this is a, it infects horses obviously, uh, it's related to smallpox. The, the virus is extinct. There's probably only one sample left in the world at the CDC, and they won't give it to anyone. And so a group in Alberta, up in Western Canada, wanted to recover it because they thought this might be a good vaccine. It had some qualities that would make it a good vaccine candidate. And so what they did, the sequence is available. You can find this on public databases, 212,000 base pairs of double-strand DNA. So they took this sequence, and they divided it into 10 bits. And those, those are the red pieces here. Here's the viral genome. It's a pox virus, a long double-stranded DNA with the ends are covalently linked. And they synthesized 10 fragments which overlap. Some of these were 10,000 bases long. So they had a company do this. And they just said, here's the sequence and the company synthesized chemically these oligonucleotides. I think it cost $150,000 to do this. Then they took those 10 fragments and they just threw them into cells. They transfected them into cells. In the cells, they recombine. Cells have great recombination mechanisms. And if there's some overlap in DNA sequence, they will recombine. And out came horsepox virus. So they recovered the virus from the sequence. So what this means is essentially, as long as you have the sequence of any virus, you can recover it. So we never really will eradicate uh, any virus. Now, smallpox, Human scourge was eradicated in 1979, and of course we still have the sequence, and so people say, well, now you could recover smallpox virus. So this brings us to this last point I want to make, and that is the ability to recover viruses from DNA. It's a brand new area, it's called synthetic virology. People are worried about it compromising biosecurity. So could we recover a virus once extinct, 1918, smallpox virus or some other, and could it be used for nefarious purposes? So in the US, we have a advisory board called NSABB, and if you propose experiments that fall under certain guidelines that might be dangerous, like the 1918 recovery or horsepox recovery, they will review your experiments to make sure they're being done under proper supervision and containment and so forth. But whenever these experiments are done, they always raise a lot of controversy. The 1918 flu recovery did, and this was one website article on Fizzorg uh, when the horsepox recovery was published. Scientists bring back extinct horsepox, raising important biosecurity questions. And they, they compared it to smallpox. Uh, this synthesis raised a conundrum. What are the implications? of conducting research that has the potential to grow biological knowledge but also harm public health. So this is a really important question that we're not going to deal with to any extent, but there's always has to be this balance between doing good and not enabling someone to perhaps make a bioweapon. Next time we will talk about virus structure. We're going to talk about the principles of making a virus particle and how they're built. <laughs>